Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And today we're having another critical conversation with Steven Erickson. Hello, Steve. Hello. How <laughs> critical are you today? <laughs> Not as critical as you. Um, <laughs> yeah. So today we are going to look at uh, a, a short section from chapter 16 of Midnight Tides. So uh, for, for anyone watching, uh, this is chapter 16 of Midnight Tides. It involves one character sort of section. That's all we're looking at. It's not giving away a huge amount of plot points, but if you don't want the section spoiled, thanks for watching until this point. Uh, that all being said, Steve. Yeah. Last time, there were criticisms that I didn't let you talk enough. So this time, you're doing all the talking. Oh, God. <laughs> well, first of all, no, you didn't, you didn't talk too much. You were actually reading sections of the book. So I guess your voice, you know, just droning on and on and on just drove somebody crazy, I guess. Usually you. <laughs> Usually me, yeah. Look what I found. It's like the first edition, the pages are yellowed. It's got... Um, I've done readings out of this book. It's got whole sections that are penciled in. Very strange. Well, that, Anyways. That, might, that must have been when you did the, the reading tour then for that book. That's really cool. Uh, yeah, it must be because I keep finding these Wyndham Hotel notes <laughs> in the sections. So I was definitely... You proud. stay in the fanciest of hotels, Steve. Wyndham? Is it? No. No. <laughs> Anyways, it's an 800 Wyndham, so it must have been maybe in the States, maybe. I don't know. So I remember I was going through some of the suggestions um, on your, uh, on as a result of the last conversation we had. And somebody mentioned Saren Padak uh, in Midnight Tides. And I thought it was one scene. It turns out that uh, what they mentioned was a particular, uh, rather a different scene than what I thought. Um, but I'm stubborn, so I went to the scene that I thought it was. <laughs> well, it, to be fair, if, if people are going to suggest a scene or a section, if they actually leave the chapter reference, then the, the chapter reference in the first line, I can definitely find it. But if someone says, you know that scene where uh, Saren Pedak is looking at the water, you go, right, which one? Well, uh, as you and I both know, we've just spent, we spent about 15 minutes looking for it. <laughs> and anyways, and I was looking for the wrong thing anyway, so. Um, well, you were giving me directions to one thing and I was trying yeah. to find the thing that they were talking about. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. Oh, well. But fortunately, it's, it's a short sequence. Um, and it's kind of, I think we can use it because it, it, it can follow up on this whole notion of show, show don't tell. And what that means to um, a writer, which is different from what it means to somebody who's doing critical analysis of a text or a body of text. Is that your but polite I, way, yeah, I, hang on a sec, is that your polite way of saying, yes, writers know what they're talking about, but you critics who keep using this term, you're using it wrong. Possibly, possibly. I, w I wouldn't say it in such blunt terms. Maybe I'll say that later in such blunt terms, but you know, I have to build up to it first. The, the thing with, the thing with um, <clears throat> show don't tell is, is the thing that generally in a, a creative writing um, context, of classes and a program and, and whatever. Um, there's always, I mean, the rules that I was sort of operating under at UVic and at Iowa was you don't write any genre pieces and genre being pejorative in that sense. Um, anything that's, you know, smacks of populism um, was just not, was not there. And so everything had to be literary. Uh, and literary meaning serious fiction as opposed to, I guess, uh, unserious fiction. Um, and so 
it was, you know, it was the death knell to hear uh, in a workshop that, uh, when somebody, you know, would look at your story and say, this is, this is, this is telling, not showing. And so that sort of um, was, I mean, it's, it was drilled in by the first end of the first term, uh, my first program in creative writing. Um, but there's a weird thing regarding show, show don't tell. Um, and it's probably where this pejorative notion comes from. But um, if it's just kept in those simple terms, um, it's kind of, kind of missing, I think, what the point was. And that is that when you show something, um, you are you are acknowledging, if you will, uh, in in uh, in what you are writing, in in the word choices, uh, and descriptions, and all the rest, that there are multiple levels of subtext sitting underneath this thing. Uh, what happens when you fall into telling, and my experience now is there are times when it's important to tell, as opposed to, as opposed to show. But anyways, just to back up. When you fall into telling in that uh, uh, negative sense, what you've done is you've flattened and compressed um, all that subtextual stuff. So what it allows the reader to do is, is to glide very easily across the surface of what's being told. And that certainly has a function and it has a place in, in pretty much any kind of narrative. There are times when you want the reader to glide very quickly across something. Um, but show don't tell has got nothing to do with style because style is a very different thing, at least for the, from the writer's point of view. Uh, it's, it, it's not, for example, um, let's take uh, Hemingway's short, short story called Cat in the Rain. It's a very short, short story. Um, and because it's that short, uh, it only has room basically for one sort of symbol to, um, have the story hang on, have the narrative hang on. And basically it's, it's a married couple uh, in a foreign country in a hotel. Um, she's looking out, out onto the courtyard and there's a cat uh, out in the courtyard. Um, and, that's, and then there's a conversation between the two characters and that is the story. Um, the, entire, the, the entire story is, is basically shown. Um, and yet it's written in a, in a classic repertorial style, which we used to call uh, Windexed. And Windex was um, a glass cleaning and is a glass cleaning product. It's a spray, you spray onto cloudy glass and you wipe it down and the glass gets so clear you can walk through it without knowing it's there. So that's the idea with Windex language. And that's a stylistic choice where the reader is, is um, well, not the reader, but the writer is basically writing completely see-through language. So it's not noticed by the reader, um, which then allows that showing to be crystal clear. Um, and so in a sense, it serves the function of telling, but it's still showing. So, but then when you look at the subtext of that story, you realize that the cat represents something else. So there's all this other stuff lying underneath um, what's being described in this story. And that cat basically is representative of passion. And that's the symbol that's in the story. It's all about the passion that is, is effectively lost between this, this married couple. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's, that's Hemingway doing his short story thing where it's the one thing that is, is going to be, um, subtextually present throughout the story. Um, now in a novel, you can do that per scene. You can do that on every scene, but if you picked up a particular scene or a particular symbol, then um, it's an invitation to actually return to that symbol in later scenes. And you can actually do twists and turns on it and shift it around a little bit. But it's, um, it's very much a case of where show don't tell when it's when it's sort of viewed in, in a simplistic fashion um it kind of misses the point because everything you tell shows 
it shows something. Um, and if you compressed everything, so there's no, you know, visible subtext apart from maybe that, you know, one symbol or whatever. Um, what you end up showing is um, your worldview as an author. In other words, is all of the, the ethos, the, the cultural upbringing that you have um, is going to show up whether you like it or not, because it's our worldview that actually um, underlies and underscores uh, the way we tell a story and the things that, the details that we find interesting uh, and the means and methods by which we, we go about creating a narrative. And all that's culturally imprinted on us, on all of us. Um, and so you end up showing that whether you, you know, whether you're just telling everything or not. Um, so, you know, the, uh, the, the class level that you grew up in, um, the religion that was taught to you um, in your family or in church or in school or whatever, um, everything. Everything that that sort of formed you as you grew up is is going to be present as the only subtext in writing that is told as opposed to shown. And so, in some ways, one of the advantages for the for the writer in showing rather than telling is you kind of obfuscate that worldview. You cloud it up um, because you've added all these aspects of subtext, um, and those subtexts that subtext basically those levels all there to serve the story as opposed to expose um, your particular uh, ethos or worldview. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, the, one of the, the sort of the classic examples I think of this is if you have a character enter a scene and you, you see this a lot, I think, in first person narratives where yeah. the, the character sees someone come in and if it is a male character, that has entered the scene. Quite often, a male author will focus on, you know, the square jaw, the these very, either like masculine, heroic, all of those sorts of stereotypical features that get associated with that type of image of masculinity. Uh, they will, might view them as a physical threat, but it, it's sort of in those terms. Whereas if a female character comes into the room and it is a male author quite often it will now focus on hips, breasts, a sexualized form. And you go, well, that's an example of the, the male gaze. That's what we talk about in terms of the male gaze. Now, an author may not have intended that. The, the author may be, oh no, but this character always notice, notices the physical characteristics of anyone coming into a room. And you go back through their chapters and you go, okay, you have four female characters enter the narrative. You have three male characters enter the narrative. Every female character is given at least one full paragraph of physical description. The male yeah. characters are, he had icy blue eyes as he strode into the, into the room. And you go, there's a, an implicit or unconscious bias in how that author has approached the physical description of these characters. And we see that an awful lot in first person narratives because it's so close to the, the author is sort of imagining that very, very close perspective. And then when you add into that, let's say they notice items of physical wealth. So what they deem wealthy is actually gonna be revealing about not necessarily what the character thinks is wealthy, but what the author thinks of as a sign of wealth. So the person was wearing a Rolex or the person was wearing like a really nice tracksuit or the person was wearing, um, I don't know, Dior whatever, blah, blah, blah. But how they have described this item of wealth, does it match up to the character's perspective or does it match up to this assumed author's perspective? And so it can be very, that's what I mean by sometimes, when I talk about a lot of this stuff in that authors sometimes include things they don't mean to, or authors are very deliberately creating uh, from a character perspective this sort of attitude. So yes, this character may be a heterosexual single man who is looking for a girlfriend. So every time he sees a female character, he sizes them up. You go, that's, that's perfectly understandable. Um, but if the character is not that, 
then why is it every female character is described that way? Mm. So it's, I, I completely understand what you're saying and that sometimes uh, what an author says or how they say it can actually be very revealing if it hasn't been disguised through other literary devices. Yeah, and, and this is why I, I'm suggesting that there is something sitting underneath the notion of show, show don't tell, ironically, there's subtext to it as well. And it's, and, you know, if I were in a workshop and, and talking about this to writers and, and beginning writers, I would be saying one of the risks of compressing your narrative to uh, exclusively just telling is um, you expose too much of yourself that anybody can actually read this and start actually piecing together uh, your particular ethos and your worldview. And, you know, if, it's not necessarily a problem, but it's, it's one of those things that the author, the writer needs to be aware of that there are um, potential pitfalls to, to particular approaches to narrative. Um, and it's, it's, it's more a case of once you become aware of that in your own writing, then you can actually start assembling an idea of your own world worldview, your own ethos. You can actually begin to articulate it because you're, at, you're analyzing your own work. And if that work was especially written first draft, just running through five, six pages of, of narrative, my goodness, I mean, a psychologist would have a, you know, a, a field day on, on those five, six pages. Um, so given that that's the case, then that's when, you know, as the writer, you go back and you go, well, all right, well, what, what is this revealing about me? What is this exposing about my, my worldview? Um, and I guess nowadays that becomes more important for the author because um, if you fuck up in that area, uh, somebody's going to, somebody's going to start commenting on it. Somebody's going to, you know, and you, you, you will have to defend yourself in some fashion or another. And, um, because writers no longer sort of, uh, live in anonymity in, in the garret uh, where they write. Um, because we all, we're all kind of obliged now to do a lot more PR than we ever used to because publishers don't bother anymore. So, um, so it's, it's kind of, it's a thing I've always sort of tried to advise, advise um, in as gentle a fashion as possible is that the, re the writer needs to really be prepared to sort of almost do the critical analysis that you're doing, but on their own text, not on anyone else's. Um, just to get a sense of, uh, you know, are there assumptions here that are operating and shaping my narrative and shaping the structure and how I approach this scene or that scene. Um, and so when that, when, you know, when you actually start examining that kind of stuff, I mean, it's very humbling to, to discover all the assumptions that, that you've made and you have to go back and sort of figure out, well, you know, is there another way of actually writing that scene? Is there another way of approaching the scene? Or, you know, are, are there a multitude of ways of uh, approaching that scene? Um, rather than just going with your gut because your gut can drag you in the wrong place uh, very, very quickly. Um, so yeah, you know, when we sit here and, and talk, I mean, I, I'm kind of addressing uh, the writers out there and, and the beginning writers out there and the people who are, are working on novels and short stories and all the rest. That's kind of who I'm talking to in, in, in terms of this conversation. And whereas you're addressing in a sense, the readers and how to read, right? How to read the text. So yeah, well, it's because Obviously, the, you you come at it from a craft perspective, and it's how the the technical aspect of how you're putting stuff together, of what you're attempting to show people, and then I'm obviously I'm a reader, and what I do is I I read it and I go, this is what I'm picking up from the text. So that's why you know when when you and I talk, uh, and I I give you a report on something, and I go like reading the section, this is what I got from it. And you can read through my notes and go, AP has gone way off on where I intended him to be. And it's not that I'm wrong and you're right, or you're wrong and I'm right. It's that there's clearly a disconnect 
between yeah. what you were trying to do and what I've received. No, it could be I've just misread something. So you look at that section and go, this is where AP went off track. This is where he started going in the wrong direction. What is it? Yeah, about but, yeah but I wouldn't stop there myself. I would say, well, why did he go off track? And of course, I, I can't know that. But then I go and look at that section and then I deconstruct it to see where I messed up. Because if I want something to be clear, I want it to be clear. And so it becomes a, a learning lesson and a teaching lesson for, for me as well. So Yeah, but that, I mean, sometimes uh, like it can be incredibly difficult to edit your own work. Um, mm -hmm. And it's like, I'm, I'm always impressed by uh, the amount of editing that say you and other authors I have worked with have done on their own work, that they are incredibly clean manuscripts and, and very, very well put together. Um, but I remember when I was writing a lot of academic stuff that quite often it was, I knew what it was meant to say. And I couldn't honestly see why other people couldn't understand that. And it, you know, it took a friend of mine to look at it and go, no, see this sentence here. I'm like, oh, right. Okay, fine. And sometimes just having that fresh pair of eyes yeah. where you, you are reading into it so much, you're of what is behind in your head that you and can't say that that hasn't come across. Yeah. You're too close for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, that's why authors have editors. That's why, you know, we, we, us parasitical editors, you know, occasionally have a use. Definitely, definitely. Anyways, that kind of is the background to this little, I mean, the section that we're going to go through, because when I first thought about it, um, it is the cat in the rain. It, it, it's, it's written in that particular um, dealing with, I guess, almost a, a single purpose in the section, but that, that particular purpose is never articulated. And so in that sense, um, what I am telling is showing. And um, because I'm, I'm tied into a particular point of view, um, you're kind of, you're left with that uh, internal uh, monologue, that, that narrative, which is a form of telling, um, but also a form of showing, but the actual subject at hand is neither shown, well, it's shown, but only once removed, but it's definitely not told explicitly. Mm -hmm. so. Well, why don't you, because it's a short section, why don't you yeah. do the, the reading as a treat for everyone and to shut me up again? Yeah, well, we do need to do that. Not the treat bit, but the shutting you up bit. Um, it's um, okay. Obviously, this is this is massive spoiler stuff. So um, by this point, Saren Padak has um, she's been up north among the Taisadur. She's come back down. She's um, gone through a period of um, fairly self-destructive behavior um, and paid, you know, paid, uh, I guess the, the highest price on that. Um, a man who secretly loved her, um, hung himself and she discovered the body. So she's in a rough, rough traumatic state. Um, and she is traveling with, um, our iron bars and, um, some of the other crimson guard. Okay. So hang on a sec. I did one of those things at the opening here that uh, really drives you crazy. When I, no. the opening line is they emerged onto the windswept sword, you don't know who they are because it's the <laughs> opening scene and it's different from the previous scene. So that must have really bothered you, AP. <clears throat> they emerged onto a windswept sword with the crashing waves of the sea on their right and before them the delta of a broad river. On the river's other side stood a walled city. Seren Padak studied the distant buildings, the tall, thin towers that seemed to lean seaward. Old Catter, she said. We're 30 leagues south of Trait. How is that possible? Warrens, Corlor muttered, sagging until he sat on the ground, rotted, septic, but still a warren. Yakwater made her way down to the beach. The sun was high and hot overhead. I must wash, get clean, the sea. Iron bars followed. 
In one hand, the encrusted object where the spirit of a Thai standee woman now resided. She strode into the water, the foaming waves thrashing around her shins. He vowed flung the object past her, a small splash not far ahead. Thighs, then hips. Clean, get clean. To her chest, a wave rolled, lifted her from the bottom, spun and flung her towards the shore. She clawed herself around until she could push forward once again. Cold, salty water rising over her face. Bright, sunlit, silty water washing sight from her eyes. Water biting at scabbed wounds, stinging her broken lips. Water filling her mouth and begging to be drawn inside, like this. Hands grasped her, pulled her back. She fought but could not break loose. Clean. Her face swept by cold wind, her eyes blinking in painful light. Coughing, weeping, she struggled, but the hands dragged her remorselessly back onto the beach, flung her onto the sand. Then as she tried to claw free, arms wrapped tight around her, about her, pinning her own arms, and a voice gasped close to her ear. I know, lass, I know what it's about, but it ain't the way. Heaving helpless sobs now, and he held her still. Heal her, Cor heal her, Corlo. I'm damn near done. Now, and sleep, make her sleep. So, if you think back on the, the Hemingway thing, um, what's, what is the unspoken thing in, in that, you know, that section? Um, and if I were to be telling rather than showing, uh, the unspoken scene, I mean, the unspoken line would be something along the lines of, I'm about to commit suicide, which of course, that's what the, that's, that's sort of the, the invisible thing in the entire scene. And, and yet when we hold so close to this traumatized character, um, we don't get to see that kind of thing. Um, even her internal dialogue or monologue is, is um, obfuscating, is uh, deflecting. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to read that section or discuss it is, is um, shortly after the book came out, I, I got a letter from, from a woman who um, apparently had attempted the same kind of uh, suicide. And she just, she thanked me for the letter, for, for actually writing the scene the way I did. So that made me sort of look back and, and think on, uh, on that particular scene. I thought it might be useful to, for us to talk about it. So if you want to do some, some technical or um, uh, analysis. Well, okay. So I'll, I'll do my, my superficial reader analysis. That's not as good as the technical writer stuff. <laughs> um, oh my, oh my. Thin skinned or what? I'm a critic. I'm critical of other people, Steve. You're not meant to be critical of me. That's not how this works. Don't you know? I do now. Thank you. <laughs> so one of the things I, um, I liked about this, now obviously we, we have that joke that I don't like where you don't tell us who the person is very quickly. But again, here it's actually done very quickly. And we know this is, we know from earlier on, this is a group traveling together. This isn't a, a brand new thing. So that isn't actually an issue in this section, Stephen. Um, I kind of knew that because, you know, the name Serenford Act shows up almost immediately. Yeah. But I thought, you know, yeah, you know. Um, but they emerged onto a windswept, windswept sward with the crashing waves of the sea on their right and before them the delta of a broad river. So we get this very exposed setting where they have they have emerged out and it is very exposed it's stark it's flat everything they, they are standing there um isolated in the view and given that we're now going to see the the isolation of that person's spirit where they feel alone you've actually set that up because even though it's a, they emerged it's a very lonely view is being set up here on this yeah. um, with the the river uh so the the waves of the sea on their right before them the delta of a broad river and on the river's other side of wall city so it's almost like they're being surrounded by water and then we have all of the the usual sort of metaphors and symbols associated with water um with the emotion of water uh sometimes being turbulent sometimes being tranquil but here we see it's the crashing waves of the sea. 
So there's an element of violence inherent to it, an element of power. Um, and that's what Serenpedic doesn't initially look at that. She looks at the distant buildings, tall, thin towers that seem to lean seaward. So the attraction to the sea is already being signaled by the towers leaning that way. Um, we then get a little bit of exposition about you know where they are and it, it helps us place it if we're going to look at the map. And then that nice sort of narrative element of talking about the Warrens, but the Warrens are rotted, septic, but still a Warren. So there's narrative development here, but even the terms rotted, septic, this idea of wounding of the Warrens, which are not a physical space or a metaphysical space. And of course, that's going to tie into the theme of this section of a wounding, both physical and metaphorical, to the spirit of Saren Pedak. So yeah. although it is describing the Warren, it is literally describing the state of the Warren, the fact that it is there adds to the thematic content that we have here and what's going on. Okay, yeah, stop there for a sec. So okay. let's go back. Let's take a look at those opening lines and stuff. Um, one of the things that I remember, and I, I'm going back to Hemingway on this one, but I mean, Faulkner does it as well. Um, it's where you lay out as much of the setting as possible in a single sentence, and you just sort of, you know, you're adding clauses and, and you sort of wrap it in that sense. Um, that I, I can certainly see that that was working here. Um, and what one of the effects is um, it kind of creates a, a rhythmic flow uh, in terms of the sentences. So it, it's, you know, it, it's a mouthful, that first sentence. Um, it's a full, full breath. Um, cause you're, you're kind of caught in windswept sword, which is, you know, yeah, it does things. Um, and then the walls cities. So I, I'm seeing alliteration, fairly obvious stuff. Um, and then the distant buildings, the tall, thin tower towers that seem to lean seaward. Um, so there is, there is a, a kind of rhythm that that's already being established here, even though it's crashing waves, um, there's still something I think in the sentence structure that's, um, but the sentence to, length is so useful. It's so useful to actually mess around with. Um, well, we, we can, if you want to talk about that in just a second, but I was about to say with the alliteration, there's also a lot of, uh, it's the combination of the sibilance as well as the, the, mm -hmm. the W sound. So it's yeah. actually that, that sense of the wash on the beach, that sense of the, the water coming in and out that that's actually, all there in the the word choice but you yeah. also have windswept which gives you that sense of the exposure feeling of the sand blowing in your face that tactile sense crashing waves is again your the idea of sound we have the the vision that you're working additional senses in not just sight and sound so it's not just sight and then people talking that the, these other senses are being uh, worked in, which is something I try to bring up as uh, almost every time when I'm, I'm discussing things as a, it's a really good way of creating a more immersive landscape, a more immersive setting because you're engaging more senses. So the mind is more engaged, but I think the, the, uh, the W sound and the repetition of the, the S sound adds to that sense of the sea washing in and out the sound of the waves the sound of the tide that that motion um gets added in there with that yeah yeah and it's it's the thing gardner always what he wrote about when he talked about writing um is how you can use uh how you can use the language and, and the way uh words sound in the mind um to actually create an emotional uh, context and emotional effect so it's not just describing setting, it's, um, it's placing, it's trying to place the reader in that setting. Um, and you actually use the language itself and sentence structure and word choice to um, pull the reader further in. Anyways, you can go on. Um, okay, you so, uh, yeah. so we, we stopped just then at, at Warren, but to then go through and go, so windswept, crashing, um, the walled city, there's there's an element of violence but also of separation in in these images uh windswept is not a gentle thing it's a much more erosive 
uh, sense. But crashing waves is clearly has an element of violence. But the walled city, this idea of being isolated, the, mm -hmm. the building of walls around people, uh, of separation. And again, it's, it's just it's a small thing built in. But when we add up all of these little tiny things that are scattered through, it all adds to that overwhelming sense of what Saren Pedak is actually going through in this section. So it was just it, to call attention to that because we didn't exactly spell it out there. Yeah. Um, so uh, the actor made her way down to the beach. The sun was high and hot overhead. And again, you have that repetition of the H sound. What is weird here is this is almost um, the antithesis of what I am expecting the temperature to be. I am mm -hmm. expecting this to be dull, gray, windswept, cold or chill. But what we have is actually this is a very bright and sunny day. And yet almost everything in this description seems to be on that duller end. Mm -hmm. And because the description is linked to Saren Pedak's point of view, yeah. her frame of mind, she is losing the color from all of this. It is a grayed out scene because that is her perception of it. Even though if the, the sun is high and hot overhead, we would expect those cerulean waves, the golden sands. Yeah. And if the point of view was, you know, an, an effusive, uh, character uh, in great mood, then yes, you, you then alter your description to actually match um, that particular mood. You, you want to convey that um, through, through the description of the setting. But if you want to do it the other way, if you want to bleed all the color from it, then that's, that's one of the ways of doing it, is that the details that that point of view chooses to narrate, if you will, um, are very, very select. And you know, for, for the writer, always always bear that in mind that that a, a character stepping into a scene or in a scene, um, and if you're going to stay with their point of view and um, stay third person, you can still do the first person kind of thing of everything that is seen around that character that you describe. You're doing it through the filter of that character, and so whatever the mood of that character is you can lay it all out just in the physical description. And so you don't have to then tell us what the mood of that character is because it's implicit in the description. Yeah. So the, and this is another point that, you know, I, I sometimes try to point out to people is the idea of using a contrast, uh, something that is unexpected or the opposite of what you would expect to highlight and force yeah. attention on the, the other thing. So it's just the, the high and hot, uh, high and hot overhead is drawing our attention to the fact that none of the other description seems to match that. So, you know, that, that's why I wanted to point that out. Yeah. It's also, it's remorseless. If you're going to have that high heat on a beach, that's windswept. Um, it, it's actually, it can be pretty harsh. And, you know, even here on the West coast, uh, you get onto one of the beaches on a sunny day and um, yeah, it all looks pleasant, but it's burning the crap out of you in the meantime. I, I seem to recall experiencing that. Yeah, I'm sure you do. And trying to find shade. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, and this is where we get the obviously the italics signaling. Yeah. In internal monologue, I must wash, get clean the sea. So fragmented, short, punched uh, statements. So I must wash. Okay, proper sense, but get clean. We, we've lost the I must from the start of it, and then the C followed by an ellipsis that is just tailed off, that it, this is actually quite, in, in some respects, very worrying language. Because yeah. the I must wash, this is not a, I should, it's not, a, oh, it would be nice to get a bit cleaner, oh, I'm a bit dirty this is a compulsion. Yeah. And it's got nothing to do with, with, uh, physical grime at all. Right. So, but, and this is I, where it starts. Uh, but this is, we, we don't know just yet that 
it's nothing to do with physical crime. We might suspect it because of the things that we've, we've highlighted thus far, but it's, I must wash, get clean, the sea. And so it's not the river, it's because there's a river delta right ahead of them. There's a river that's close to civilization that you would expect to be potable water, clean water. But no, going into the sea, the salty ocean. And the it, crashing waves, yeah. And the crashing waves that are violent. This is not where I would go to get clean when there's a river right beside me as well. Mm -hmm. So it is suggesting that this is not just about having a wee bit of exfoliation. Um, yeah, so example, if, if, I had, if I'd written, uh, I need to wash, get clean the river, uh, that's that's perfectly logical, right? It, it's it's single-minded, sure. It's focused, but it's pointing us to the river, so she can take a bath, right? So, the other way around, it, it, it's again word choices. Um, I guess the author at that point already knows what this is about, and so that's how that's what sort of dictates the words you choose. Yeah, but obviously, as she's a been reader, avoiding it. she's been avoiding it in scene after scene preceding all of this so um, um yeah and as a reader going through it obviously there would be certain signals earlier on in the text that would have built to this moment but even going through this we're seeing how it is building toward that so it's just as i'm proceeding down i i'm trying to show how it sort of it comes across rather than what you're intending for it to be mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, what i i think is interesting in the, the next section is in one hand, the encrusted object where the spirit of a teased Andy woman now resided. Yeah, and I can't remember what all that's about. So, well, regardless of its narrative value <laughs> and its its narrative connection, yeah, the idea of again focused on a female spirit that is in uh, trapped in an encrusted, a dirty object that the spirit is trapped, which obviously thematically ties into what we're talking about here with Saren Pedax, that she's the spirit inside herself that is in an encrusted object. She feels unclean, even though it's it's not a physical issue. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I, I can't comment on that because I don't remember what that's related to. Um, but just looking at it right now, um, It's very much in keeping with what iron bars would do. Um, one of the things I'm suspecting is that when I'm writing this scene, I'm well aware that iron bars and Corlo know what's going on with Saren, and they're 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 staying close. Let's put it that way. Um, as an editor, I would have gone back and I the next the next paragraph is she strode into the water. I would have said Saren strode into the water because the she now could refer to the Thai Sandeep woman. So there's one of those things where I look back. This is why I don't reread my stuff and think, oh, shit, I should have fixed that. So. Well, yes, there is an ambiguity there because the spirit of the Thai Sandeep is, is this now a, a pronoun confusion? But, yeah. um, and also if iron bars, if you didn't know that iron bars was male, you go, well, uh, is iron bars female? She strode into the water because it could be referring to iron bars. And then you have, well, maybe it's a typo and it's meant to say he. Um, yeah, exactly. So yeah, that's, that's unintended ambiguity. But yeah. from, because of the perspective, because of what's going on, you go, no, it, it's, it's meant to be Saren Pedak. And yeah. it's easy yeah. enough for a reader to see that. But yes, you could have cleaned up that language. Yep, definitely. Um, so what I like here was she strode, and this is forceful, direct motion. This isn't walked. This isn't ambled. It isn't daintily tiptoed in and and got her feet wet. She strode. So this is very direct, forced, uh, straightforward with a purpose. Right, and this is one of those instances where the preceding "I must wash, get clean, the sea," the internal thing is actually leading to the physical action. So you got the, the internal landscape 
uh, of those thoughts, which is actually the impetus for what she physically does next. So for writers, you can do that. You can pop, you go back and forth and you, and you don't need to throw in an extra sentence there to, to link them up at all. Cause one leads to the next leads to the next. And you can do that kind of hopping across the stream kind of thing uh, by alternating internal monologue and action that they don't have to be, um, they are linked, they are linked because you're tied into the point of view. And then the second half of the sentence I really like because it kind of does a lot of double duty. So foaming waves thrashing round her shins. So foaming waves thrashing. Obviously this is that violent language. It's very descriptive. It's very visual as well as tactile that you get a sense of that uh, spoon, the, the whiteness of the, the aerated water uh, all around her legs. But because it's foaming, it actually ties into this idea of cleansing because soap foam and bath foam and, and that sort of, we, that image is, is tying into this idea of why she is seeing it as being cleansing and cleaning. It's um, also violent, isn't it? It ties to the crashing waves as well and the violence of that. So there's, there's a bit of, um, almost scouring oneself, uh, you know, to the point of pain involved, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is why I said the first thing, which was the violent thrashing around her shins, creating that whiteness. I, yeah. I did, did say that Steve. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. <laughs> okay. And so where were we? Um, um, the avoid flung the uh, the object past her a small splash not far ahead. So this is an interruption, and yeah. Iron Bars is clearly trying to interrupt her. Uh, th th we see this as an interruption both in the narrative, we see it as a thematic interruption that it it works again on multiple levels of Iron Bars trying to subtly intervene without physically intervening at least i think and it's showing not telling right so it's but at the same time i'm having to tell what's happening right yeah yeah um because thinking about it the avoid flung the object past her he could have thrown it in almost any direction but he threw it directly past her to interrupt her so we are assuming a level of intentionality to iron bars actions. Yeah. And that that's why I am interpreting it that way. Um, a small splash, not far ahead. So again, quite close to where she is. This is an avoid. This is a powerful warrior carrying a very small object. He could have hurled it any distance, <laughs> but it lands just in front of her. That's that's why I'm I'm interpreting it that way. Yeah. So then, and then it's sentence fragment time, um, where I'm I'm blending. We already had the sentence fragments in her internal thinking, and now we're we're dipping. We're we're, we're actually blending the sentence fragments of the internal thoughts into the actual actions. So thighs, then hips, um, but, and then clean, get clean. So, yeah. So what we had, we had, I must, must wash, get clean the sea. So we had that internal, she strode into the water up to her shins. Then we have thighs, then hips. Then we move back to clean, get clean. And then we move to her chest. So we're getting this movement from yeah. internal, external, internal, external, the movement backwards and forwards, that wave motion, almost yeah. one could describe it. <laughs> um, but rising each time, the, uh, the threat is getting higher each time because it's moving from standing on dry land, her shins, her thighs, her hips, her chest. And she hasn't even gotten undressed, right? She's just walking in, right? Yeah. Um, and what's interesting, well, uh, a wave rolled, lifted her from the bottom, spun and flung her uh, towards the shore. No. I think that's an unintentional uh, bottom. Oh, for God's sakes. You, yeah, you Brits, man, oh man. It's where you go every time, isn't it? But 
And the, well, this is one of the issues about publishing in or using any sort of language. What you choose may be a slang term in another mm -hmm. part of the world, and it is absolutely unavo unavoidable. So, okay, yeah. Well, let me ask you, you, you from the 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 UK, um, the the bottom of what you're standing on when you're in water. The seabed. What? The seabed? Seabed? You want to call it a seabed? Okay. Yeah, we would call it the bottom because, you know, you dive in and you touch the bottom. Yeah. Oh, no. And, and you don't get arrested for it. So, <laughs> you know. But it's, but I will tell you why that actually sticks out as a, an unintended point of connection that you didn't intend. And it's because right. you've had shins thighs hips chest and then bottom no you've gone the wrong direction that way i i know but it's because of the list of physical aspects that then when this gets flagged when it when it appears in the sentence she is lifted from and it's the bottom but it's very easy for your brain to change that her bottom well your brain yeah yeah but I am saying that's why this mistake happens because it is clear it means this the seabed yeah. the bottom yeah, of so, the so you're flagging the lifting bottom that sticks out. <laughs> why am I friends with you? I don't know. Um, but lifted her from the bottom, spun and flung her towards the shore. So the sea is actually almost acting to save her. The, yeah, the sea exactly. is trying to save her, but. Again, it's spun and flung. She is out of control. This is not a measured movement. It is slightly violent. It's not coordinated. This is slightly wild. And you answer that with, she clawed herself round until she could push forward once again. So that clawing is so visceral and violent to describe that movement of her. No, don't you try to bring me out of this water. Um, yeah. And then so she could push forward again. So we're going back to that striding forward, that pushing. This is deliberate, forceful action on her part. Um, yeah. Anything to add? Uh, I mean, the silty water, I'm assuming, relates to the fact that she's kicked up a lot of silt for her thrashing about. And there's, there's, there's a curious sort of constant repetition here with the water. Uh, it appears one, two, three, four. Yeah. It's, it's used four times in, in two, two sentences. I think that's right. Three sentences, three sentences. And I don't think that's accidental. Um, I want that water flooding in everywhere, right? Yeah. It's everywhere it burns, basically. And of course, like they, we then get that very, f um, if, if anyone has nearly drowned, mm -hmm. begging to be drawn inside, water filling her mouth and begging to be drawn inside, that feeling that ordinarily that is a panic inducing mm -hmm. feeling mm -hmm. whereas here there is a desire for it and it is coupled yeah. with painful violent imagery just before it because it's biting at scabbed wounds stinging broken lips water filling her mouth and begging to be drawn inside so the answer to all of these wounds is just to start breathing in the water so it is very clear what is being discussed here mm -hmm. especially with like this yeah um, and that's it you confirm it with yeah. the the, in, the interior monologue and then hands grasped her pulled her back she fought but could not break loose and then clean so again she she doesn't want to be stopped from doing this she is trying to cleanse herself and this is how she's seeing it. And 
someone is trying to to bring her back and we would guess even though it is not stated that it's iron bars because mm -hmm. this is the person who has tried to intervene before and who is yeah. quite close by yeah and who knew what was going on yeah um and you know then we we get this is now her um her, her recovery and still longing to to go back out there and iron bars trying to calm her to be sympathetic to um extend that compassion and empathy and safety yeah and the curious thing if you get to that paragraph where her, her face swept like cold wind um eyes blinking in painful light uh i think the the key there is um she has been barely holding on all the way up until this point um especially following burrock the pales um suicide um and yet she has been um, completely unemotional, completely detached. But when she's being pulled out and she's being dragged back into the world, uh, she's not just coughing, she's actually weeping. And that weeping is not related to anything that she just went through, right? It's related to the reason for her doing what she tried to do. So, okay. And I don't think I could have used weeping at any point preceding this. It has to happen now, right? No, because she's basically helpless. I'm going to do something that you uh, probably hate literary critics to do, and which you didn't intend, which is talk about this as a birth metaphor of rebirth, because she's emerged from the water, uh, so her face swept by cold wind, eyes blinking in painful light. So this is actually a lot of birth imagery, coughing, weeping. She struggled, but the hands dragged her remorselessly onto the beach. So again, we're getting the sense of she is a newborn babe. She's being dragged out into this new life and life is painful. You remember like, even in all those scenes in movies where you see the baby being born, the first thing the baby does is scream and cry. Mm. Uh, this is what we're seeing here because it is a traumatic experience. It's emerging from trauma. And this in some ways is a rebirth. And this is where literary criticism, I think, sometimes takes ex these extended metaphors slightly too far, because I think that is reading a bit beyond what was intended. But a lot of the imagery and language fits. Um, let me think about that. I mean, you know, I was asked for uh, what image I wanted on the cover of the book. And I said I wanted, you know, three figures, Tysadur, emerging from the sea. And all the way up, you know, in, in this narrative, we have a lot of things arriving from the sea um, that are initiating all these massive changes. Um, and um, Hannah Mosag taking and, and guiding uh, a god through the waters. Um, so I think what happens is, yeah, once it's one of those bell ringing scenarios right once once you sort of run it you want to ring it a few more times um in different different contexts um and another way of putting that would be um if the chat if the cat in the rain was a chapter in a novel well we would see the cat again somewhere in that novel probably multiple times in different contexts as hemingway would then start working that particular symbol and and weaving it through the narrative um so I suspect there's a lot of that going on here. Um, and, you know, wherever, I mean, we get a, we get a rebirth from the ground as well later on in the book, don't we? Mm -hmm. um, Saragol. Yeah. And, but there's also, there, there is that a lot of birth rebirth sort of imagery in this. There is. Of, there is. So, I mean, that, that's possibly why I'm seeing a lot of that in that paragraph, because this is a, big theme in this so yeah. you maybe didn't intend it specifically for that section but it just it works so well as a a point of connection for a lot of the other stuff that happens in the novel that it ties in nicely and i i didn't want it to sort of uh, drift past but what i i liked with two last things on this is um heaving helpless sobs now so this is the, the dam is broken. Mm -hmm. um, this is the release of pent up 
emotion that she hadn't been able to deal with, this burden of emotion inside is finally has burst free. And it doesn't mean that she's healed, but it's the beginning of at least acknowledging this problem. It's yep. the, be the beginning moments of, of when this can be dealt with. But what I, I liked here is uh, Corlo is obviously not, you get a sense that Corlo doesn't really care right now. Because, no, no he's, he's not, yeah, he's not too. Because Iron Bars is like, heal her. And he's like, I'm damn near, you know, I'm tired. You know, and it's, and Iron Bars is adamant. No, no. And then sleep, make her sleep. She needs time and rest to get over this, to start getting over this trauma. It's not that she'll be healed automatically, but start the process and give her a chance. And I like that. It's not forcing the issue. It's, it's a case of where you can do characterization with, with very few words, because um, it's all laying out. I mean, Iron Bars is barely in this scene, but he's, he's crucial in the scene. And um, on one level, he's by saving her, it's an act of compassion, but she certainly wouldn't see it uh, as that at this point. So I know that, you know, as a writer, I, I'm setting up, they're going to have to talk at some point. They're going to have to talk this through um, because he, he basically um, overstepped his agency uh, and, and dragged her back when she had made her decision. Um, and that's the thing is that even though, you know, you're talking about something like um, uh, a suicide attempt, um, I remember, you uh, a lot of my, my dad's work uh, as a child psychologist in, in schools uh, was dealing with this. Um, there are attempts and then there are attempts and some are, are, um, some are gestures and some aren't. And so, so there's this kind of an ethical question of, you know, in our society, we've made, we've made that genuine attempt or effort, uh, an illegal act, but, there's no, there's no reason that any other particular civilization would be with the same way, especially if it has a different relationship with the notion of death and what follows death and the notion of death for that matter. Um, um, death to society that, that a living person uh, carries with them uh, that you can only evade by dying. So, you know, uh, there, there's other ways of, of, of looking at it. And so I, I think I wanted that ambivalence that in a sense, Iron Bar has actually overstepped his ground, his, his boundaries, um, stepped into her agency and uh, made a decision on her behalf. And um, I suspect, I, I hope at least in the rest of the book that, yeah, she does have issues with it. I can't remember, but I think she does. But at the same time, it's, you can see that um, Iron Bars is not acting in a nasty way or... or no. This is clearly from a point of compassion, a point of caring. Yeah. Um, what is also interesting is that Corlo may or may not care, but certainly in this scene comes across as he doesn't, even though he is not in the scene really no. at all. He's in the scene even less than, than Iron Bars. Yeah. And yet we still get a sense of his character. He's tired because he's just taken them through this rotten warren and gotten them to here. And Oh, she'll be fine. You know, it's certainly more self-centered than, than Iron Bars. Yeah, and, you, and, and if you think about it, you can do all that in like just a couple lines. And uh, the alternative would be, you know, uh, adding more lines and, and changing them to the effect that Iron Bars says to Corlo Healer. And he says, okay, that suddenly you've lost an opportunity there. You've lost an opportunity to actually do characterization in just a single exchange. Um, but Or what you could have done was had, um, I'm damn near done, said Corlo, because he was exhausted from blah, 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 you know, and spell it all out. You could do that. But that's, that's I, I keep talking about extrapolating from the information that you're given. And yeah. the thing is, with stuff like this, you are given so much information that a lot of that extrapolation a lot of that inferring the further point is actually it's very very clear 
that this is not guesswork. It's you look at this and you know that's what the other half of the phrase was. You know that's what this was. You have a very, very strong suspicion that this is the reason why this happens and so on, because it has been signposted so clearly in the subtext that reading it from you're only given part of a phrase or you're given part of an exchange, you can fill in the blanks yourself because you already know. And this is what showing does that you actually uh, remove a lot of that opportunity when you tell because you've collapsed all that possibility, all that liminal space that sits underneath what's going on. Um, and that's probably going right back to the workshops. That's probably why, you know, those, those, uh, jaded cynical instructors with their you know their dozen books um and languishing career in in creative writing um would tell you show don't tell and and that i think i think it goes right back to that that is that is one of the reasons why um it can be so much more rewarding to actually show than to just tell but at the same time there there's a place for both and and narrative should be able to manage both of them with with equal facility and if you can pick and choose when you want to really sort of create all that foam and all that liminal stuff sitting underneath uh, a particular uh, scene or event then in some ways if a lot of the other stuff is telling then you're highlighting it to such an extent that um, it could either knock the reader out or signpost it too clearly hmm. i don't know it may just depend on on a particular approach to the writing that the author has. Yeah, but um, well, I th I think we've we've gone through this pretty exhaustively. We've we've uh, hopefully this time given given the audience much more Stephen Erickson and far less AP. Um, and everyone's thankful for that AP. <laughs> just kidding. So, no, I like your analysis and and definitely touching on sort of. Um, some of that subtextual thematic stuff is, I mean, I was just looking at it at sentence structure and all the rest. Um, so yeah, um, it's really nice to, to sort of get that, that side of things as well. Um, the whole rebirth thing just suddenly, yeah, no kidding. Uh, but at the time it wasn't, it wasn't one, anything I was really, um, thinking about in terms of this, this discussion. So I was fixating on show, don't tell. <laughs> Well, um, why don't we why don't we leave it here for this one then? Because uh, I I think we've done a fairly good job going through this, and I I hope that people have been entertained. So yeah, thank you very much, Steve. I again I greatly appreciate the time that you've taken to to sit down and do this. This is uh, this has been a lot of fun, and it is very interesting. Uh, so oh, thank you very much. Yeah, I hope it's interesting. Um, and again. Uh, to, to anyone who is still watching, if you want to select or suggest a scene for, uh, for Steve and I to look at, if feel free to leave it in the comments, but try and at least, you know, give book, chapter and a, a hint about the scene so it's slightly easier for an idiot like me to track down. But thank you very much for... Oh, hold on, hold on. Oh. Yeah, one other thing I wanted to mention is that... Um, you know, before you started recording, we, we were both online looking at some um, people providing editorial services. And uh, the one example that I'm not going to name any names or anything like that or point to anybody in any direction, but the editorial advice, um, just like just like what we just have here uh, to any reader out there, any writer out there, rather take it with a grain of salt, because some of it can be just absolutely you know, if you start hearing adamant rules about putting together a narrative, run for the hills because it's just, that's just not the case. Um, you can you can write any freaking thing you want if you are able to then justify it. If you have reasons for doing it and putting it the way you want to put it, no editor uh, actually worthy of the name should touch that stuff with a 10-foot pole because it, it's what you do. And they can't do it, so fuck them. Um, and so, you know, there's stuff out there. As a writer, 
take what you can, take what's positive, take what's useful for you. Um, but there are no hard and fast rules in any of this, in any of it. And if you start thinking in terms of those hard and fast rules, you will block, you will block yourself so fast um, because we need, we need that ephemeral free flow of, of the notion that there are no rules out there um, and to just go and, and see where the story takes you. So for what that's worth, um, you're seeing a lot of that editorial stuff out there and these people pontificating and telling you specific rules on, on how to do things uh, no, no, I wouldn't pay for that. I would not pay for that. Well, I, I know in creative writing courses, when you start out, they start out talking about rules. And then as you study, as you practice, as you get better, those rules become guidelines. And then what you find out is those guidelines are actually, well, if you do this thing, you create this effect. And then once you understand what the effect is that you're going for, and if you do it in a different way, you're going to create a different effect, but that's the one that you want. That's when you start bending rules, breaking rules, doing things differently because you understand what you're doing. But you, yeah. I think you have to start out at the beginning actually understanding what's happening and how it is being done. So I think a, an initial approach to creative writing at the very, very beginning that's when you think of these things as hard and fast rules, that it's prescriptive and it must be done this way. But the longer you actually practice it, the longer you study it, the longer you are uh, doing this thing and getting better at it, the more you realize that those are not hard and fast rules. They're not even guidelines. It's a way of describing how an effect is created when you do something a certain way. Yeah, yeah. And, and... I remember stepping into my first, almost my first week, I guess, I had a class with W.D. Valgardson called uh, Narrative Structure and Fiction. And I think it was the first lec or the first class itself. Um, we all wide-eyed, not knowing what, we were, what to expect in this thing. And he said, this is a course to teach you the rules so that you can break them. And that was it. And yeah. so... And he said, you got to learn the rules before you can break them. If you, if you think you can come in here breaking all the rules with, you, with your narrative story and you're not even aware of the rules you've broken, then it's not going to work. But you actually have to know that whatever you take something out of in terms of narrative structure, whether it's plot, dialogue, characterization, um, sentence rhythm, diction levels, whatever, whatever you pull out, you need to replace it with something because the human mind really needs the completion of that package. Now the package can be made up of disparate parts, but we need it complete. Um, because obviously one of the ways that we discussed it at university was if you think of cinema, that if you go back to the 1920s and then to the 1930s, and we see the evolution of cinema and they go, this is how you, you plant the camera here and you have the action here. And there's the 180 degree rule. And then we see, well, what happens if you break the 180 degree rule? Well, it causes the audience to become uneasy or the audience, the audience to, to the, uh, suddenly perceive things with, uh, there's ambiguity about what's going on. And you go, well, that's actually really useful for horror movies, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And then when you see what Sergei Leone did with the Western and like huge, big shots where instead of always having the person huge, it was the background was huge and the person was a little tiny person on a horse because it, it was a different mode. And everyone would have said, that's breaking the rule. You need to be focused on the actor. And mm -hmm. he was focused on the landscape. It's if you know what the rule is, you then get to break it or bend it until that actually becomes a style or a trope or a technique that other people start copying. Quentin Tarantino shooting the opening of the car boot, the car trunk from inside. So you saw it open up. How many times have we seen that repeated now? And yet I can't think of an instance of someone doing it before him. Mm -hmm. But, and that's because he went, well, this is how you do it. He came up with a new way of doing something. And that's because he broke one rule and, and tried to do it with something else. Um, I think when, and I, I, I try when I am editing not to be prescriptive, that I try to 
illustrate what I am thinking, why I am thinking it. And if I think there's an issue or if I think um, something needs cleared up, sometimes I will make suggestions because that way you can see from my suggestion, if you haven't actually understood my poorly articulated reason for what I have a problem with, from my suggestion, you go, oh, I see what he has an issue with because I see how he's trying to fix that aspect. It, it's a way of communication. I don't go through your work and go, nope, this is all wrong. You shouldn't do this. And that, that's what we were looking at. Yes, on that other, that other site, which was just atrocious because it, it was already published work too, for fuck's sake. So really? Yeah. But um, yeah, so if people want to leave, suggest now that we've wandered off track, back on track, pretend to be a professional. If people would like to leave a suggestion for another scene for us to look at, please, uh, by all means, leave the, the title of the book, uh, the chapter, and then like a very brief description. Short scenes are much easier to do than very, very long scenes. You'll see like this video is going to end up quite long and we were only looking at a tiny scene. Yeah. But uh, Steve, thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. That was fun. Okay. Uh, thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the next one.